Uh, I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institute here at King's College London, London. and I guess the, the first thing that I really want to say is uh, what an absolute delight it is to hold an event in person. Um, uh, seeing people in three dimensions instead of on a flat screen and in two is so much better. Uh, this is actually the first external event outside party conferences that we've been able to hold in person, and it may well be our last for a little while, seeing how things, things are developing. So we're going to really enjoy uh, tonight, and thank you all for, for making uh, the time to come. It will obviously be it is being live-streamed, uh, so other people who can't make it can actually see, and it will be on our YouTube channel. And of course, we're being as cautious as we can in the circumstances, um, so we do ask people to wear masks when you're uh, not talking. Uh, uh, where you can and uh, do spread it. We have spread it out nicely, which is, is good. And King's has obviously also increased things like ventilation in venues like this, so we are uh, doing all we can. It's, it's also a pleasure to have at our first uh, in person event such an important and innovative report. Uh, this one on uh, managers and academics in a centralizing sector by Professor Alison Wolfe and Dr. Andrew Johnson, which has been uh, generously funded by the Nuffield uh, Foundation, as well as supported by the home institutions of KCL and uh, UCL. Um, so we're very grateful for that support. Alison is the Sir, uh, Sir Roy Griffiths Professor of Public Management at King's. Uh, she also sits as a cross-bench peer in the House of uh, Lords and has been seconded part-time into the government since 2020, I think, Alison. Uh, David is uh, Associate Professor at the Social uh, Research Institute at UCL. Uh, we're going to hear first from Alison, uh, and then David on key aspects of the report, uh, and then we're delighted to have responses from uh, John Morgan, who is policy and politics reporter for Times Higher uh, Education, and then from Lord David Willits, who among his very many roles is president of the Resolution Foundation's Advisory Council and their Intergenerational Centre, and of course a highly valued visiting professor here with us at the Policy Institute. Uh, and of course I see We've got a, a small and select audience, but it's also a really expert and engaged audience uh, for today's uh, session. So while we, we've only got an hour for this session, uh, but we will make sure that we've got time at the end for questions, comments, reflections um, from you. So given that time pressure, I'm going to hand straight over to Alison to kick us off with some, some of the key points from the report. Alison, please. Well, thank you very much, like Bobby, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, it is completely different to talk to three-dimensional flesh and blood people as compared to talking onto a screen where you don't have a clue what anybody is, is doing. And I am going to, I'm not going to attempt to summarize the whole report. That would be crazy. But I would like to say a little bit about why Andrew and I did this research and why we were delighted that the Nuffield Foundation funded it. And also to say as a very proud and I actually think loyal member of King's that, that I actually think this evening encapsulates what universities are about, that we really do believe in looking at things even if they might embarrass us or cause us difficulty. And I would like to acknowledge the enormous support that King's has given me always when I have worked on university policy issues of the university and the fact that, you know, for example, when I was on the Augur Review, nobody ever tried to influence me and nobody ever try here tried to, to, to tell me what I should think. The other thing that, so I, I, I really think I, this is a very good chance for me to express my appreciation of this great institution. The other thing I would like to say is, of course, I am speaking tonight in a personal academic capacity, although as... Um, as Bobby has said, I'm currently seconded part-time to the government working on skills policy. This is work that I the, where we completed the research, completed the, the data collection before I ever went. Nothing that I say is in any sense associated with anything that, that I do in government or that government might or might not wish to do. So having got those preliminaries over, um, the new staffing patterns of, higher, of UK higher education, what is going on and does it, why is it going on and, and does it matter? So I think the place to start is probably the global context. This is a world in which there has been a huge growth in student numbers, huge growth in participation rates. So institutions have become enormous. 
We have very large numbers of students studying overseas, we have market competition, and we have a student population which is, as many people will, some people will complain and other people will say, and quite right, um, operates in a Students have always been consumers, but they consume in a different way. They're very sensitive, for example, to institutional reputation. And one of the previous pieces of work that Andrew and I did looked at just how much money it brings you to move up a few places in the international rankings. So the first question that we asked um, is, if universities are operating in this new, new environment, if they're devoting major resources to marketing, to publicity, to what is commonly known ar around the place as the, the student experience, how does this affect them? Does it affect their core role? Does it strengthen it? Does it undermine it? How does it change it? And quite specifically, in this environment in which research matters so much to your international reputation no matter which country you're in. How does this, what does this do for what was always the primary function of universities? Universities started as teaching institutions. Their core activity remains teaching. And yet the research is now not merely a core part of what they do, but it has become something which affects dramatically the way that they are seen and the value that people think they will get from the acquired reputation of attending a research intensive institution. And so there was a very specific question, which I know occupies many academics, which is, are, are the two coming into conflict? The traditional pattern has been to think that it's a good thing to be taught by research active people, to think that teaching and research complement each other. Are they becoming separate and what is this doing? And the other thing which I suspect most people here will be very aware of, but which I think most people outside the sector are not, is that there are otherwise there are specific aspects of the UK which affect dramatically the decisions that people running universities and people working in universities take. We don't have a student number cap overall, which many countries still do, although we still do in some medical subjects and architecture. We have um, income which is overwhelmingly from fees, but at institutional level, again, the research excellence framework is fantastically important in hard cash as well as in reputation. We have a steady growth in governmental regulation and oversight, the Office for Students, Competition and Markets Authority, National Student Survey, which makes a huge difference to, to how people operate. So is the result that our universities are more and more like other large businesses? And have changes in this commercial and regulatory environment increase the importance and power of central departments and teams? And these are questions which have been floating around the, the, the sector, not just in this country, but, but more generally for a while. And what is extraordinary is how little empirical evidence there has actually been. Academics and the policy world are convinced that power has shifted away from academics. I think they're perhaps not quite as vocally convinced as, as doctors, but um, <laughs> you know, so, I don't know how many people here have anything to do with hospitals, but they're quite convinced of this. They're quite convinced that there has been a, a, a dramatic shift in power. And this is not a particularly UK phenomenon. USA, Australia, France, Sweden, you talk to academics, you talk to people who run academics, they will talk about the growth in administrative staff, the shift in, in, the, in the locus of control. And there's also a very specific concern about increases in short-term insecure teaching contracts and a sh shrinkage in the numbers of traditional research and teaching academics. And in this country, the UCU has been very occupied with this, but again, this is not a specific UK concern. But as I said, there has been remarkably little good evidence on managerialism, on changes in the workforce. And what evidence we do have about the growth in insecure, poorly paid teaching staff is overwhelmingly American. So basically, we went to the Nuffield Foundation, we said, this is crazy. This country has fantastically good data, which it does. The Higher Education Statistics Agency collects very detailed information. Um, we would like to have a proper look at this. And so the, the research which is summarized in the monograph, and those of you who are really interested can also download a much, much fatter report, um, was, large, it was quantitative but supplemented by case studies of six very different universities. And what we wanted to do was to look at what had happened and try to understand what was going on. And I would like to emphasize again that what we have looked at is overall sector changes. 
we've taken this, this huge database, which looks at particularly 117 generalist universities, and what we are analyzing here are the general trends, not what has happened in any given university. So what has happened? Well, actually, it turns out that the number of non-academic staff relative to academic staff has actually fallen a bit over the last 20 years. If you just look at gross figures, you will see that, in fact, back in 2005, there were about 120 non-academic staff per 100 academic staff, and this has now gone down to just a little bit more. Um, actually, these you, you could look at this as sort of quite staggering. I mean, that actually is an awful lot of non-academic people. And if you were in a school, you would not find that sort of ratio. Nonetheless, it is, not, it is true both that there are a very large number of non-academic people working in universities, and also that in straight terms, it has not just been shooting up to the skies the way that my Swedish colleagues insist has been the case in Sweden, and I couldn't possibly comment because I haven't looked at the data. <gasps> However, the composition of that internal workforce has changed dramatically. And this is quite interesting because I would also like to say that, that you know, this has been a period of enormous strides in information technology. And actually, you would think that that, that downward curve that I looked at is, is sort of what you would hope for. You would hope for, for productivity rises. You'd hope for that to come through. So you could argue that in some ways it has. Um, we don't have any secretaries anymore. When I first became an academic, you, and you worked in an academic department, you didn't have a secretary per person, but you had some secretarial help. Academics today essentially do not. They, 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 they just don't. And secretarial numbers have correspondingly plummeted from 2005 even to 2018. Um, more surprisingly, so have technicians. But as a proportion of the workforce, what we call managers and non-academic professionals have unquestionably risen. So those two columns on the left show, and, and indeed all of these, show a really major shift in the internal composition of the workforce, and actually a very rapid one. You know, um, 2005 is not that long ago, actually. <laughs> um, the other thing that we looked at was we, we looked at this in terms of different university groupings. Ours is a very segmented university sector in many ways. Many European countries have far less differentiation, though they quite often have a smaller university sector and a polytechnic one. But what is interesting is that although there have been some general trends which are quite common, like the disappearance of secretarial help for academics. Um, there are nonetheless some quite marked differences. And what you see here is that the, the growth of the managers and professionals relative to the number of academic staff is most marked in the Russell Group. So, you know, you've got a sizable, significant increase in the number of managers and professionals per 100 academic staff, in, particularly in the older universities. What is also striking about this, um, and I just want to flag this in passing because I do think one of the other things that it's important to understand is how differential, how great, how increasingly differentiated universities are, is that um, there are lots of non-academic staff in the university sector as a whole. There are quite particularly lots of non-academic staff in Russell Group universities. Because what those, those, um, those figures on the left show is that in the Russell Group, basically, there are, there's, one non, there's one member of non-academic staff, roughly speaking, for every six students. Where if you go to the post-92s, other than the former polys, you can actually see that they've effectively they've been having a financially tough time. There were 12 students per non-academic member of staff, and it's now heading up towards 20. So, Lots of kind of differing things going on, but underneath it, this, this really significant shift. Now, we did try to find explanations for what are very high levels of variability even within a sector. So I've said, you know, there's the Russell Group, but within the Russell Group, there are lots and lots of differences. Some of those may be to do with, do you outsource your catering? Don't you outsource your catering? Do you fill in the form in one way? Do you fill in the form in another way? But, but basically, there's a lot of variability. But we, we found that we, we couldn't, from the data, predict the, 
this. Um, sometimes we could see an institution heading almost for going over a cliff and it always hauled itself back in time, but there have been some quite interesting incidents in, in, in the finances within the sector. But the only thing we could find was that if you have increases in real income per student, it does translate into increased growth in managerial numbers. But the other thing that did come out very clearly, and it's another aspect of these dramatic changes that, have associated, that are associated with moving to a mass system, moving to huge institutions, and moving to a far more international, competitive, and I would say commercial environment, is that there is ongoing and really, again, quite marked centralization. In the past, departments were not exactly worlds of their own. That would be a great exaggeration. But they, they were the focus of activity. And they had, for a start, they had, you know, they had secretaries. They had non-academic non, non staff who were very much part of and essentially part of the department. That is less and less true. Professional services staff, non-academic staff, are increasingly part of centralized functions. And even when they are physically in a department, which in some universities increasingly they're not, they are very much managed from the center. And this is another major trend. It may have pluses, it may have minuses, but it's part of what has been really a transformation of the sector in the last quarter century. So turning to the other bit that we were looking at, which was changes in the teaching workforce, um, we didn't look at research staff, where numbers have gone up, pure research staff, but we were very interested in this issue of what is happening to teaching staff, and which, as I've said, is something which very, very strongly um, concerns people in, I would say, especially in the systems which are most globally competitive and most involved in in international recruitment. So if you talk to American academics, if you talk to Australian academics, if you talk to New Zealand or Canadian academics, they will, they will have the same concerns about what is happening to the teaching workforce as we hear from both academics and unions here. And so again, the question was, you know, is, is it as bad as people make out? Has there been a dramatic shift towards using people on short-term, part-time, underpaid contracts? So, again, when you look at the data, you can, I think, genuinely conclude that it's not as dramatic as you might think from some of what you hear and read. But what is also interesting, I think, again, is that what you have got is you have got an enormous shift, again, within, context, within you know, less than 15 years in the staffing patterns of the, the biggest universe, the, and they are the, big, the biggest, the most visible, the most prosperous, the research intensive Russell Group universities. They were far less likely to use teaching only staff as recently as 2005. This is, they, they have now, it has now gone right up. And if you look at the, at the report, you will see that the proportion of additional hires that are in the teaching only category is really quite dramatic. Um, this is the other thing that is quite interesting is that um, we also break this down. We also break this down in terms of full-time versus part-time teaching, and you know these big increases are. First of all, the, the other old universities have also had a sizable increase. The Russell Group has had a huge increase. The ex have had some increase in full-time. The other new, not at all, but for part-time teaching only staff, again, except for the Russell Group, it's kind of flat. So you're not, you're not seeing a huge, huge sector-wide shift to part-time, hourly paid, insecure staff. But you are seeing a pretty steady increase in full-time teaching only staff, particularly in the older universities, and you're seeing a pretty dramatic increase and shift in what is happening in the Russell Group. And one of the things, that, I mean, one of the reasons we went out and talked to a wide variety of, of universities, including in Scotland, to see if their different model had any very dramatic impact, and the answer is it didn't, um, is that compared to the US or Australia, the growth of teaching only staff in this country has been really quite modest. On the other hand, if you compare it with the universities of as recently as the 1990s, it's been pretty dramatic. The other thing that was quite interesting was that when you look at staff-student ratios, which is something which tends to occupy people a lot, if you just look at straight staff-student ratios, um, 
in the Russell Group, which has had a very prosperous 15 years, they, they, they improve markedly. When you take out the teaching only staff and you look at the ratio of students to traditional teaching and research staff, you find that actually those ratios have got rather worse. And what I want to, um, the reason I sort of put that up is not just in order to sort of, you know, hammer my own sector, but to say that this amazed people. When we went round on, the, on, on our case studies and pointed this out, they went, are you sure? Because actually they'd never looked at this because for the, well, two reasons they were surprised. First of all, it wasn't one of the ratios that most people calculated. You calculate the ones you have to calculate, you look at those and you don't look at them. The other reason they were surprised was that it, wasn't, it, didn't, it didn't fit with their lived experience, which was of central teams going, you're not allowed to hire anybody who isn't publishing. You've got to get somebody who's, a, who's, a, who's research active. So the pressures that they were aware of were those of the ref, and the ratios they were aware of were the ones that they were collecting. So what was going on was sort of underneath. And, and I think it's, it's two things. I mean, it's you don't hire anybody, and then you've got a gap, or you've got people who are increasingly bought out in research, and you have to get a gap. And you have a sudden increase in recruitment, and you've got a gap. And so there's an inexorable rise. And then once you've got that, it's very convenient, and they do a lot of teaching, and that's fine. So there was a very strong preference for hiring research act active academics for very good reasons, and I think that's why we're nothing like as bad or good as Australia or America. But nonetheless, underneath it, there was this constant and ongoing condition. So I'd like to stop there because um, I'd like to, we're, we're all going to come up, but I'm going to suggest that the first person who talks is, is, is Andrew, as my research colleague who has done at least half of the work, if not probably more. Um, was, because I think there is another question, there's a question underlying this. We've, we've seen this shift, we've seen this shift to more teaching only academics. We know people are really upset about it. Should we be? Should we be upset about any of this? Should we be upset about the increase in managerial numbers? But I think above all, as teaching institutions, is this shift away from the traditional teaching research model, model something that we should care about? And, and what does the other research evidence tell us that also tells us whether this is something that we should be worried about and trying to fight? So that's it for me for now. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alison. That was great. Yes, thank you. Very good. So, yes, please, Andrew, I know you want to add some, add some points. Thanks. Uh, th thanks, thanks, Bobby. That's, um, and thanks, Alison, for, for a really excellent and, and thorough summary of, of our research. Um, I just want to add, to add um, a couple of things to, to, to what Alison has said on the on the academic staffing side. Um, uh, firstly, I, th I think it's, it's worth emphasizing that the growth of, of contingent teaching only staff is, is very much an, an international trend. Uh, so in the US, for example, there's been a, a, you know, a long term trend right back to the 1980s, um, having, having a, a lower proportion of staff on um, tenured or tenure track um, Routes and, and increasing numbers on, of, of part-time and, and non-tenured staff. Um, in Australia, it's been estimated that in 2000, that as long ago as 2011, that there some 61% of academics were on casual contracts, and that up to 80% of, of first-year teaching was undertaken by sessional staff. Um, I, I also noticed a, a report in last week's Times Higher, which said that 78% of academic, academics in Germany were on fixed-term contracts. Um, so, so to say that, that this is very much a, an international trend, this, um, uh, this switch to, to teaching only staff. Um, so so I, I think that we were trying to look at similar trends in, 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 the, in the UK, but we, we've broadly concluded that although there has been very considerable growth in teaching only staff in the UK, it, it hadn't gone up as much as in some other countries, um, particularly those with marketized systems such as um, Australia and the US. Uh, the, the second point I want to make is, is to ask what, whether the growth of contingent teaching staff uh, matters and uh, what, what, what consequences it, it has. Um, and, and clearly, um, pe people who are on very, very casual, uh, short-term contracts 
that that's likely to be detrimental to their to, to well-being of those staff and also to their their potential for career progression. That's I think uh, well established in in the literature. Um, but the, the evidence also suggests that it may impact negatively on on students. Um, so pretty much all, all the evidence is actually from the from the United States. Um, and it look, looks at various outcomes such as um, graduation rates, progression from one year to the next, um, test scores, and so on. Uh, and, and it compares part-time and, and non-tenured staff with, with, with their, their full-time full and tenured academic colleagues. Um, and basically what, what emerges from that is that the um, that the, the outcomes for students who are taught by the, the, the non-tenured non -tenured staff tend to, be, um, tend to have worse outcomes. Those, those students are doing uh, rather, rather worse on average. Um, and that, that's a, a somewhat um, counterfactual um, finding. You, you might suppose that um, if, you, if you had staff who were specializing solely in, in teaching, um, that, that would have beneficial outcomes for, for students. Um, uh, so, so what, what seems to be happening here, what the, the answer seems to be that the, the, the contingent staff often have really heavy, heavy workloads, they, are, um, they have poor terms of employment, so they maybe, maybe they don't have access to training or access to staff progression, uh, even access to, to good office facilities and so on. And that, those, that lack of facilities for the, these um, teaching only staff in, in, in the US uh, feeds through into, into worse outcomes for, for, for students. So, so what, what follows from that, I think, is that if we do want, if we do have increasing numbers of these contingent teaching-only staff, it's important that they have good working conditions and are not overburdened with, with workload. If we want um, good outcomes, both for, for those staff and for the, for the students that they're teaching. So I think that's that's enough. For, that's for great. Me. Thank you. That was really, really helpful. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, John, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I thought the report was um, <clears throat> really valuable in shedding light on and quantifying some important trends that universities appear not to fully under understand themselves, but are nevertheless happening. Um, just a couple of caveats. The first on how we know that these are uh, bad things and have negative consequences. Um, I doubt there are many people who would argue that having significantly more uh, teaching-only academic staff is a good thing for universities, but there probably is counter-argument that <clears throat> some would make on the expansion of non-academic staff numbers and that counter-argument would be that as universities become more advanced there's a need for more specialized professional roles in administration so there is that counter-argument there um, and then in terms of the drivers that the report talks about because of the the nature of the data um, the report can't quite establish a Cause, cause and effect between the external drivers and, and what's happening. Um, the HESA seven subcategories of non-academic staff are very broad, so you can't really get a sense of the way in which um, a competitive market in student recruitment has led to an increase in admissions professionals or the way that the REF has led to an increase in the number of research impact managers. So it'd be very interesting to get a more sort of granular sense of, of the data and um, the relationship with the external drivers, but that would probably, you'd need um, to either gather better data or do some FOI trawl through, through university's um, staffing data. Um, <clears throat> then in terms of the, the solutions, um, this is a report that doesn't set out to look at solutions to the problem that, that it identifies, but does raise some, some big issues that are worth exploring further in the argument that, um, that its evidence presents a case that the internal organisation and governance of our universities requires some quite urgent attention. Um, so if there was to be any kind of shift in the balance of power back to our academics in university governance um, that would help address the issues identified in the report, how would that shift be initiated and, and who would drive it? Um, you've got the, the sector-wide body in, in, in HE on, on governance is the Committee of University Chairs, and that's fairly wedded to the status quo and is quite low profile. You've got the UCU. Or um, well then there would be the idea of some kind of government-led uh, external review of university governance. Um, one former Universities UK president often used to worry that 
some big university governance scandal would provoke uh, a government review, but it's hard to see what catalyst um, there is remaining that, that there could be for the government to initiate any kind of review of university governance. VC pay has been an ongoing governance failure for many, many years, doing great damage to universities' public and political standing, yet it hasn't provoked any, any government intervention. Um, and in any case, you wouldn't imagine that uh, an external review of university governance would have driving a shift back to universities as self-governing academic communities as its top priority. Um, but yeah, you, you would need some kind of significant driver if you were talking about moving against centralization and, and shifting the balance back to, to academics um, within university governance. And you'd, yeah, you'd be talking about going against the grain of 1988 and 1992 legislation and CUC guidance that means the majority of university governing body members are now external members rather than academics. Um, and one contributing factor to the shift towards centralization not mentioned in the report might be the rise of the, the manager academic, um, as Mike Shattuck, one of the sort of leading academic experts on university government governance has put it. It's interesting that the report mentions Germany as an exception where um, academic staff numbers have have sort of exceeded the growth in, in non-academic staff um, numbers, and that's kind of a, a, got a different model of management. You tend to get um, the university leader who's, who's an academic, who's excelled at research and moves into leadership for a few years, then goes back to, to being an academic. In the UK, it's, it's a very different sort of model, and VCs might start out as academics, but they might, they then rapidly become quite specialised professional managers and can move across to, to manage other universities and you have a kind of specialized class of, of manager academic, pro VCs, deputy VCs, provosts. Um, so there might be an argument that that's a contributing factor in, in um, driving centralization and, and, and the growth of a, a specialized managerial class. But then on the other hand, you'd have the argument that without a specialized class of manager academics, you'd arguably have management not equipped to, for the job of running a complex organizations such as modern universities are. Um, but generally, it's quite hard to see how any shift of balance back towards academics and university governance could be achieved without some broader shifts in the ethos behind the system of higher education um, in a system of competitive student recruitment, for example, where there's such huge risks to, to universities if they don't get their student numbers and admissions right. It needs specialised admissions professionals, so there, there is a, a much broader context here. Um, but it'd be interesting to hear from from David whether, in his time as a minister, uh, he or anyone else in government ever got close to feeling that something must be done on uh, university governance. Mm. Well, you're, you're doing my job for me there, John. That's perfect. Perfect segue into David. Uh, any reflections, please? Yeah, well, thank you very much. And of course, Alison's work is uh, interesting and empirical and thought-provoking, as always. And it's a very interesting and important piece of work. Um, behind it is the uh, ongoing debate about the character of the university. Uh, this is adding some evidence in a couple of specific areas, but that's the wider debate. And there was a time in my career when almost every month I was debating with Stefan Collini and people about whether and how the character was changing and, of course, to what extent the government was to blame for it all. Um, but these are both trends linked to the character of the university. I, I, I just do look at both of them. And, and Alison is very careful in the paper. She's very neutral. Uh, she's identifying a trend. She doesn't immediately jump to a view about what is good or bad. And so, and for that, to be honest, we do need to delve even deeper into the data. So this question about non-academic staff and academic staff and closely associated with it, centralizing or not centralizing, um, probably mental health is one of the biggest growing issues facing universities. To what extent is mental health a, resp a kind of pastoral responsibility of the academic staff in a student's department? To what extent should it better be delivered by professionals? And if so, should they be linked to the department or centrally? Um, careers advice. Uh, do you, does the economics department have the expertise to place its economists in jobs doing economics? Or is that a general university-wide careers advice function? 
recruitment, uh, where you know, one of my biggest concerns about the pattern of English education is early specialization. Departments recruiting people with deep prior knowledge, including students with good A-levels, um, is one way in which early specialization is promoted. I remember talking to one academic from a Rust Group University, going to an American university, he said one of the first things he noticed was he had absolutely no say in who was recruited, and the uh, first he knew of the students who were interested in his course was when he gave the first lecture. So on all these questions, there is a genuine open debate about what is the optimal structure given the responsibilities that universities now face and to what extent academics can or should be seen as kind of pastoral leaders responsible for some mental health advice, some careers advice, getting involved in exactly who is recruited to study economics or physics. Um, then the second trend uh, research, uh, teaching only staff. Now, my knowledge of the evidence on teaching only staff and teaching quality is, I'm sure, much less good than Alison's and others. But when I did look into it, I must say, I've, the evidence seemed to me inconclusive. It was not, ob of course, we like to think that being taught by someone at the cutting edge of research in his or her discipline is a good thing, but the evidence about what constituted good teaching quality and to what extent it was associated with research activity, to be honest, I thought was not at all clear. So I'm not even sure that teaching only staff is such a bad thing, as John says. Uh, if we look behind that to the drivers, let's get back to the crucial issue of the character of the university. My view is there is one overwhelming driver which links both of these trends, and it's quite simply competition in research performance between universities. And although the REF is often identified, and I'll turn in a moment to some observations on the REF, my view is this is a global trend. This is not because a group of particular funders and policymakers in the UK have decided on a peculiar experiment. If you look at the global market for researchers and people applying around the world for jobs around the world in a range of global universities, research activity, research performance, driving rankings of universities, including, if I may say so, John, in the Times higher rankings, is the crucial driver. So if I think the simplest explanation of what's going on here, which may be um, too simple-minded for Alison, is that all the effort is recruiting research active academics who are going to get to the top of the league tables and removing any other responsibility of theirs which gets in the way of their producing the papers that will get published in the prestigious journals. It's what they wish by and large for their career and it's what the university wishes in order to promote its rankings. And it's paradoxically, and that was always one of my frustrations, it's what's in the, great, in the kind of rational interest of the students if your, if your department focuses on high quality research rather than teaching you, but as a result of that research goes up the rankings and hence adds to the prestige value of your degree, that is not a totally absurd contract. So it seems to me that is what the driver is and it's behind both trends. Now, just let's narrow down finally into the British context. The REF certainly does, is part of the story. I think it's a reflection of a wider global challenge, but it's part of the story. And I, I mean, I'm on the record on this. I thought that the Russell Group pressure, for example, to which Nick Stern responded in his review, that all research active staff should be submitted to the REF, was a mistake. I think it created a, even more of a monoculture and even more of a focus on one particular form of research excellence. And it probably drove the categorization of some staff to be defined as no longer research active. So you could imagine at the periphery changes that might ease some of the REF pressures. But as I say, I don't think they will change the issue that, for example, King's faces when it's trying to recruit a new professor and working out what the offer is when someone turns up from Japan or from uh, Berlin uh, or from the US Ivy League and asked for a job and one recruiter was saying to me, pay lat mattered more for recruiting these people. What that met mattered, sorry, what mattered more than pay was a commitment that their teaching hours would be low or minimal. So those are, so I don't think that, so the ref is a, is part of the story but not total. And then on the other one, the other driver uh, which Alison also touches on, is growth. 
is universities becoming very big? And I would like, finally, therefore, to comment on, on, John's, uh, on John's question. What concerns me increasingly, as the policy Whitehall Westminster establishment focuses on this idea there's too many people going to university, which I don't agree with, I think it's a simple empirical observation across the OECD. In most years, in most countries, the number of people going to university grows, and I do not see any prospect of that trend changing. But this belief that too many people are going and somehow we can, we can nudge it down or we can stop it happening or whatever means that we're not preparing for the obvious scenario over the next five or 10 years, which is more students. UCAS is saying that by 2025, they expect to have a million applicants. That is partly driven by international demand. It's partly the demographics of an increase in the number of people in their 20s. It's partly just more and more people wishing to go to university for any given demographic. That means, if we do nothing, if we keep on thinking, oh, there's too many, but we can somehow stop all this happening, we've got some ingenious device, then we fail to plan for growth, and what happens is individual universities get bigger and bigger. Much more rational, and I think a response to Alison's analysis, would be to say, if this is a growth sector, we need to have another moment, like the Robbins moment, when we plan for some new universities. And I personally think planning for new universities, given the obvious future trend for growth, is a high responsibility on government. And every year when we're in a state of denial about this obvious trend for which if we are responsible in our attitude to public services, and I count education as a public service, every year in which we f fail to ignore the manifestly obvious trend to driving behavior is an opportunity missed. Thank you very much, David. That was brilliant. Um, I'm going to give uh, Alison Andrew a chance to respond to caveats, qualifications from John, and some of those uh, challenges back from David, just as you think of your question. So quite, quite short responses. We can, Alison and Andrew, but then uh, we do have a microphone, I think, somewhere. So we do have a microphone. So... Oh, we've got one. It's all right, Alison. We've got someone in the crowd. Okay, just, just very briefly. I mean, I think in part in, in terms of, you know, um, John's question about you can't f create, you can't be sure of causality. No, no, you can't. And with, a, uh, you know, with the size of that sample and the number of variables hurtling around, we're, we're, we're not going to be. But what you can say is that there have been there have been really quite dramatic changes at a speed which slightly surprised me. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they came from somewhere. I, th I think um, I agree with a great deal of, of what David said, though a lot of this, I think, is about the Russell Group. Um, it's the Russell Group which is which, where you can see this, and one of the things which comes out very clearly is that the Russell Group has become increasingly distinct in a number of ways, and that may be good, it may be bad. One of the things that it's done, of course, is it's just become bigger and bigger, because actually one of the results of, of, of our system is that there's nothing to stop us all just growing and growing if people want to come to us and we're willing to take them. So I think the 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 size element, I, I would I would say is 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 nonetheless important for everybody. So there I do agree with you. I think that a, a lot of the dynamic that we were seeing um, in terms of, of research activity is specific to the world's great research universities. But the impact of size is common everywhere. The, across the globe, I completely agree with you, we have moved from small institutions which were essentially run by academics to very large bureaucratic institutions. And, and if I'm now going to go beyond the, the data a little bit, what you see, I think, here is the, the result of a, ve a very large bureaucratic institutions behaving the way that very large bureaucratic institutions behave. And there are always good reasons in large, mature, institutions for the center to argue that it needs to centralize more, that it needs more managers. The, these are quite common trends. I think what worries me is that, and here I am going beyond, beyond the evidence to, what, to why it concerns me, is that if you think about what has made universities extraordinary, and not all universities are extraordinary, but as a sector we have been extraordinary, um, it has not been associated with being the sort of places that very large bureaucratic organizations are. You know, if this, you could sort of 
describe a lot of this to, to, to Max Weber and he'd know exactly where he was, but he wouldn't see it as a source of entrepreneurial activity, innovative ideas, or the sort of places that universities at their best have been. Now, I don't think we can put the genie back in the bottle any more than you do. We are, in, for very good reasons, in a world of, of, of mass organizations. The other thing I would say is, as an individual institution, you can always get, give good reasons why you need more managers. But one of the other things which I really would emphasize is that even within sectors, there is a huge amount of difference. They don't all have, they don't all do as much as, they, as, the, as the others do. So, so there is room here. And some institutions seem to manage with many fewer managers or many fewer of all sorts of things than others. I don't know why, and I don't begin to know how you would find out who, which was the, the most productive approach. But whereas in the broad, I agree that there is, um, that, that these are trends which if not well, they weren't, I don't know if they were predicted, they should perhaps have been predictable. Um, there is still a lot that individual institutions can do. And although almost everybody was centralizing, not absolutely everybody was. Great, thank you, Alison. Andrew, is there anything you wanted to come back on, to maybe on that teaching only stuff and the outcomes that come from teaching only stuff? From the evidence and then if people put their hands up any questions uh, we will get the microphone to you well, that's handy very close to the microphone very good Andrew is there anything um, no I, I think that David is right that the the, the evidence on, um, on on quality isn't um, isn't it's overwhelmingly it's overwhelmingly about the US and therefore it's somewhat limited in terms of applying it to, to the UK so you know I, I think it's right that there is there is scope there for, for, for more um, analysis and, and more data and I, th I think uh, John's point about causal impact is also in, um, a complex one and, you know, it, with, given the data that we got it, it is challenging to, to address the, 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 the causality issue or the, what, basically what we've tried to do is to, um, to, to analyze trends using the quantitative data and then to, to, to ask to, to go out into the field and ask, and ask people about what, what the, what, the um, what the underlying explanations might be thank you Thank you, Andrew. So we do have a question, I think. First question. Any others, just put your hands up. We'll come to you. Hi. Um, uh, speaking as someone who's at the coalface, who's been casualised uh, in a casualised role since 2015, um, I'm now on my fourth contract. Um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's quite uh, dangerous to assume that teaching only staff do not do research. Um, we, we take jobs that, that we can get. We often work very, very far away from where we actually live. I currently work at the University of Edinburgh, but I live down the road in Bermondsey. Um, and, you know, I think it's extremely dangerous to assume that teaching only staff um, don't do research and aren't actually research experts because we do that all in our spare time. All it means is that we have to do it because we're thinking a lot of the time, I can't speak for others, but many teaching only staff want to get on a ladder to a research and teaching role. Um, people take jobs because they are there. People don't necessarily want to specialise in teaching. Um, so I, I just think, I, I understand this is a very big uh, quantitative survey, but I do think that, you know, you do need to take in these nuances into account. And so when you talked about how, um, you know, oh, but, you know, you might get taught by someone who doesn't do research and it, it, there's no, you know, well, we do research. Mm. So I think it's, it's really, really important to remember that. Um, and, you know, um, casualisation is a, is a huge problem, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you. Thank you. That's a really, really good point on the subtleties in the data. Alison or Andrew or anyone? Andrew or David, maybe. Yeah. Well, anyone. Any reflections? I think we could definitely register it as a, as a very strong, good point. Uh, data limitations and the subtlety of the, the uh, process. If we have one here and then one, one there. I'm um, Shidish Kapoor, I'm the president at uh, King's College London. Alison and uh, Andrew, thank you very much for turning the microscope on ourselves. You know, we usually know more about the underbellies of Drosophila, but less about how universities are run at universities. So thank you for doing that. I probably wanted to link what you said, David, about the causal impetus for this. And I speak at it from internal knowledge of the internal budgets of four universities, one in the US, one in Canada, one here, of course, and one in Australia. And, and the question that rises from the trends that you found, Alison, and mostly in the Russell group, is you see the following things. 
the unit of resource per student has gone up when you put in the international students in, right? So there's more money. Yet the number of uh, non-academic staff has gone down, which means there's more money. And then we are hiring more teaching only staff, casual or not, which should still mean more money. But then you can go and look at the accounts of universities and they're not producing more margins than they did before. So they're internally consuming that surplus. So then you've got to ask the question, where is it being consumed? And I put forth three possibilities and, and I can share my uh, set of four. One is you could say all of this money is going into marketing to chase the international students. And I can tell you that is just not correct. There is a little bit more marketing, but if you look at the level of growth, and I can speak with confidence for four internal data sets that I know, there is marginal more. The biggest marketing, as David rightly said, is what Times Higher does for us. Mm -hmm. that, that people know us because of our international ranking. We don't have to go around you know, making beautiful work. So, so that is not the case. So that leaves two other possibilities. It's either going into facilities, that you know, we're building waterfalls for students and climbing walls for them. Actually, in UK universities, that's not dramatically true. Which leaves the third option, which I think is where it has gone, which is in building the research infrastructure to support that chase for the internationally competitive research, which then supports your position in the league tables, which then brings in the international students and that's how the economy goes around, and that's why you see this selectively more in those universities, the Russell Group types, than you do across the system. And you see it in Australia, and you see it in Canada, and to some extent you see it in the US, but in the US it's split. Public universities are like ours, the Ivy Leagues are not. Harvard has 6,000 undergraduates, and most of them are domestic and not foreign. The place where you don't see it is some of the European mm. universities, some, not all, particularly Germany, yeah. because they've been insulated from this need of getting international student revenue. So I think if there's a causal diagram that has to be drawn, sadly the culprit in all of this comes out to be the underfunding of research and the real ambition and appetite of our universities to compete internationally in research. So I don't know if it ties it all together, but look, that's a yeah. personal yeah. anecdotal view. Yeah. No, that's uh, that was, uh, incredibly helpful. And Alison, David, any reflections on that? Well, I very much agree with that analysis. I, um, uh, and the crude, the crude estimate was always that kind of domestic students roughly cover their costs. Uh, there's a revenue gain from international students, and you use that to cross-subsidize research. Uh, and one of the anxieties, if there were things like some of the AUGA proposals on, and you would get lowered fees, is that you instead shift the international students to cross-subsidizing the domestic students, and research gets a hit. Um, so I agree with you on the model. And as I said, the paradox is that um, although it's not perfect, the intervention about teaching only staff, but most people get something out of it, including it is rational for the student to see the money driving research excellence and hence her own university going up the rankings. One angle I'd add, the Europe is different, and there are several reasons for this, and, um, uh, and I'm, I'm intrigued to see whether in the long run the excellence initiative changes the model in Germany, because the excellence initiative was putting a toe in the water in a much more... Uh, Anglo-American uh, Anglo model. Um, but I think underestimated in this is the, import, is the domestic language issue. Because it's quite important culturally still to have teaching in the home language of the different European countries. Whereas research is now increasingly in English. And that drives a wider gap between teaching and research. It's one of the underlying reasons, I think, for a different, for why you tend to have in these countries, you're more likely to have non-university-based research institutes or, uni or research activities further removed from the teaching function of the university. We don't realize how, in a way, lucky we are that the language of teaching in these internationally active institutions is also the language of research. And I think because we're sitting in this particular goldfish bowl, we don't understand how significant it is if the language of teaching is different from the language of research. Mm. I think that one of the things we know is that there is no limit to what a university can spend. Effectively. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
I, th I mean, I agree that it isn't, you know, again, we, we have inevitably, I suppose, focus a bit on, on, on the Russell Group, although the growth in, in the, the change in the mix is, 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 is general. But I, I, I would come back to the fact that, that the, the fact that for the, 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 the top universities, um, you can go on generating money. It doesn't go all go into facilities, but some of it does. I think I, we've said at various points in the research, this was a theme that came up again and again, that if you want to justify another position, you go, it'll increase, it'll improve the student experience, and that will keep our students happy, and, and that's always a good way of doing it. Um, so I think that, that what I do feel is that there are sort of two things that still need explaining a bit, um, or not perhaps explaining some the, the 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 mix varies and it's very hard to believe that the miraculous equation of expenditure and income is always done in the most efficient fashion and that 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 at times of plenty we are nonetheless using the money in the best way possible and it does bother me a bit, this is now stepping right outside, it bothers me more than a bit, that, that we don't seem to have put much of the, the increased income into the teaching experience. So that, I think, the, the logic is, is impeccable. And, and as I said, one of, the, one of the previous bits of work that Andrew and I did was, was, was actually putting a price on how much for, for research-intensive universities it helped to go up. Um, but I think I would also come back again to the fact that as institutions get large, there are ways in which they behave. And that applies just as much if you are a large European university as it does if you are a top-ranking American, Canadian, Australian, um, British one. And I do think that without having any answers for this at all, but just looking at universities in historical perspective, which some people here will know I, I like to do. Um, when you look at the periods when universities have been at their most remarkable, these have not been periods when they have been large, highly regulated, bureaucratic institutions. And so I don't want to sort of sit here and be a voice of doom, and I don't want to say it's all because these dreadful senior management teams go on and hire more managers. It, it really isn't, it isn't as simple as that. It's the dynamic that you've put forward, that David's put forward. But I also come back to the challenge that, that, that this brings forward. In these large bureaucratic institutions, there, there is a genuine shift in decision making. The centralization does shift power. I mean, it may be completely necessary, completely inevitable, but it is a shift. And I think that it has implications for the nature of what have been quite remarkable and special institutions, whether or not they were the world's great research universities or whether they were primarily associated with local teaching but staffed by research active people, and I do completely agree with that. So I don't have an answer, but I think there are, there are, challenge, there are challenges inherent in our results for where the sector is going, and perhaps somebody brighter than me will think of some way out of it. Excellent. Thank you. I did promise one more question to... Do you still want... To, uh, I realise we're one minute over, so if we can keep this... I'll speak very... Quickly. Short. Um, I'm sorry if I repeat something others have said. I found the acoustics a bit of a, a challenge uh, at times. Um, I, I've been involved in helping to support teaching in universities for 30 years or so, and so um, everything that is said is very familiar. It's a very interesting report. Um, what strikes me is that um, there's been a turf war about who does academic work and who does not, and what does the academic mean, and are administrators respectable for so, so many years. Um, I would suggest with teaching, the important thing is not, is somebody formally a member, a, a research active member of staff or a teaching only member of staff, because it's actually to do with the way people teach rather than entirely their background because it seems to be perfectly obvious that somebody can be from a strongly research active background but be a very dull teacher indeed mm -hmm. and somebody who focuses principally on teaching but nevertheless has you know good higher education um, understanding can teach in a problem-based way or a research-focused way 
you don't have to be at the top of the tree yeah. to be able to, to, to teach well. Yeah. But if it doesn't matter whether somebody is academic formally or not, what does matter, and this has already been mentioned, is when money gets siphoned off from teaching into research so that people who do little teaching get a certain amount of their funding from teaching and those who spend all their time teaching are underfunded yeah. and on part-time contracts and so on. Yeah. So I think those two yeah. messages work together. Very good. Excellent. Any final reflections from the panel on that? I think there's just that a, is, lot, a lot of agreement. That, if I may say so, and I, one of the areas where I disagree with Alison is the focus on the Russell group. That is a reminder of what, if, you, if this was a non-Russell group exercise, some of the non-Russell group universities would be particularly eloquent on the point you've just made. Very good. Yep. All done. Very good. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to draw it to a close there. Um, um, but this is a conversation that is clearly going to uh, continue uh, uh, beyond this. Uh, just one personal reflection for me is I've, I've conducted consultancy across lots and lots of different industries for, for many, many years. And uh, none of them like looking at themselves that closely. It's, <laughs> it's a kind of common reflection. So I have to say, as a, as a relative outsider still, I, I think it's a real credit yeah. to the university sector in yeah both in all sorts of ways, and collecting, first of all, then sharing freely this type of information, then analysing it in a high-quality way. Um, it's only when we can engage with that sort of evidence that we can actually start to find ways to improve it, including in understanding the nuance so that we're not capturing in the evidence. So, uh, absolutely. So it's just left for me to say thank you all for coming, uh, for braving this on our first and last uh, 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 in-person event of this year. Um, the Nuffield Foundation, um, the Nuffield Foundation for uh, the, the funding, thank you very much for that. The support from King's and UCL uh, for the researchers involved in that. To the Policy Institute team for putting this uh, event together. To our excellent respondents, John and uh, David. And of course, finally, to the report authors, Alison and Andrew. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.